thank you, Richard. And actually, one of the uh, books to which I contributed that uh, Richard uh, uh, mentioned, the metaphor, uh, the handbook on metaphor, was actually edited by our second speaker, Ray Gibbs. Um, so you, you'll get a little bit of dose of this. I handed around a score. There's not enough copies, I think, for everyone, but there's certainly the opportunity to share which um, part of, of uh, getting this wonderful opportunity of a Fulbright uh, chair that I'll have at McGill is that I, I had to go to an orientation at the end of September in Ottawa to learn how to be a Canadian. Um, and um, since I'm from Minnesota, um, it, it's not as much of a retraining as it might be if I were, say, from some other place. Um, but anyway, uh, I, I know that uh, uh, we learned that Canadians are, are very good about sharing things. So um, I trust that, uh, that you'll be able to look on. Um, and uh, again, this is a piece that I'll be uh, talking about uh, in some detail. I apologize. It's a little bit tiny for those of you like me whose eyes uh, have a little bit more uh, trouble getting this stuff. But I think you'll be able to get the, the salient features of this. Now, as one might expect, the path from the strange world summoned by Lewis Carroll to the surreal fantasies of Jorge Luis Borges is a relatively short one. In the novel, Sylvie and Bruno concluded from 1893, one of Carroll's characters, who appears to have come from another planet, describes improvements his countrymen made to maps. As they gradually increased the scale of the maps, he related, we very soon got to six yards to the mile. Then we tried a hundred yards to the mile. And then came the grandest idea of all. We actually made a map of the country on the scale of a mile to the mile. There were concerns, especially from farmers, that a map of this size would cover the whole country and shut out the sunlight. So his people dispensed with the map and, as the visitor proudly observed, we now use the country itself as its own map and I assure you that it does nearly as well. Borges later adopted Carroll's conceit and expanded it into a paragraph-long fantasy entitled Of Exactitude in Science which summoned a moment from an imagined past when map-making reached its zenith. In that empire, the craft of cartography attained such perfection that the map of a single province covered the space of an entire city, and the map of the empire itself an entire province. In the course of time, these extensive maps were somehow found wanting, and so the College of Cartographers evolved a map of the empire that was of the same scale as the empire, and that coincided with it point for point. Less attentive to the study of cartography, succeeding generations came to judge a map of such magnitude cumbersome. And not without irreverence, they abandoned it to the rigors of sun and rain. In the western deserts, tattered fragments of the map are still to be found, sheltering an occasional beast or beggar. In the whole nation, no other relic is left of the discipline of geography. The task of the cartographer is, in certain respects, comparable to that of someone trying to understand a work of music. In both cases, one must select from a complex and multidimensional topography those elements that are most conducive to comprehending and navigating the whole. In both cases, one can succumb to the temptation to include ever more detail in search of accuracy, precision, and scientific exactitude. Where the comparison breaks down is in the correlation of domains. For the cartographer, the challenge is to find a way to represent the elements and relations of the real world in the two-dimensional space of the map. For the music analyst, the challenge is to find a way to capture the essence of a nonverbal sonic domain through words, symbols, and diagrams. The issue of how the domain of music is correlated with other domains has played a prominent role in my work, for I believe that the study of such correlations can tell us much about how both the cognitive processes that inform our understanding of music and about the way musical materials are organized. Previously, I focused on metaphor and conceptual blending as ways meaning is constructed through mapping between music and some other domain. But over the past few years, I have focused increasingly on analogy as a process that is basic to both metaphor and blending, and that makes it possible to think about meaning construction in the broadest terms. To explore how music can participate in analogical mappings, 
Let me set aside cartography for the moment and consider relationships between music and a visual image. My example is prompted by Toru Takamitsu's Equinox, a short work for guitar written in 1994. The complete score is provided on your handout or the handout of your neighbor. Takamitsu's work draws its inspiration from a 1968 etching and aquatint of the same name by Joan Miró. I have a few observations to make about the etching, but I believe it might be productive to let you first have a few moments with it as you listen to Takamitsu's composition. I would also like to encourage you to listen to the piece without looking at the score. If you're like me, you'll find this rather hard to do, and I certainly won't think ill of you if you allow your eyes, to wand your eyes as well as your ears to hear. That said, a few of the points I will make later may be clearer if you try to follow the progress of Takamitsu's piece without the score. And please, grab a seat someplace. There's, I go on for a while.
Now, let's first consider a few of the features of Miro's etching. I should say at the outset that what I don't know about contemporary painting would fill encyclopedias. And so to help with the interpretation of the etching, I consulted with Charles Palermo of the College of William and Mary. Palermo noted that the etching employs an iconography and approach to image long established in Miro's work. For instance, the simple figures involving three intersecting lines represent stars. The yellow patch on the left would probably be in interpreted as the sun and the yellow-orange circle on the right, the moon, which, of course, are in a kind of balance at the equinox. The heavy black lines describe a kind of human picture. Moreau's situating of the sun and moon in the place where the figure's eyes would be suggests an interpenetration of, or equivalence, between the figure and the cosmos. As Palermo wrote in a note to me, if the sun is in the figure's eye, then the figure is transparent or in a kind of mimetic relation to the world, such that the things it sees, whatever is in its eyes, and otherwise experiences come to constitute itself. Its lower body is in the dark earth. Its head is redrawn, so to speak, with a line of sky blue. Trent Leipert, one of our graduates with UBC Connections, recently observed two somewhat contradictory forces at work in the etching. On the one hand, there are structures that point to the hypercharged sexuality and evidence in much of Miro's work, the sinuous intertwined lines, for instance, as well as the egg-like shapes below them. On the other hand, the face of the figure is, on the whole, rather neutral, a sort of blank slate onto which a range of emotions <coughs> might be projected. Although the etching has much to offer to interpretation, I myself doubt whether there are many direct correspondences between Miro's etching and Takamitsu's composition. It seems to me that the etching was a point of departure for the composition, not its raison d'etre. That said, there are at least a few analogical correlations between the two that are relatively easy to draw out. The brief high register choral uh, clusters of measures one and two, for instance, could be matched to the celestial bodies of the etching. The oscillating figures sounding in the lowest register match to the horizon above which these hover. The rapid flourish in measure four match to one of the curving lines at the center of the etching. Correlations like these raise two questions. First, so what? What does an analogy between depictions of celestial bodies and a high register chordal cl clusters tell us about the organization of musical materials? Second, what is the justification for such analogies? That is, how is it that we can correlate sounds with images? It is the latter question that I find particularly interesting, not least because answering it provides a somewhat fuller way to address not only the first question, but also the larger question of the relationship of musical analysis to musical expression, or to put it another way, how we draw our maps of the musical terrain. My presentation today is in four sections. In the first, I'd like to offer a brief survey of research from cognitive science on analogical processes with a view toward understanding how music participates in analogical mappings. In the second section, I shall offer a survey of some of the basic musical materials of Takamitsu's Equinox with the aim of developing an understanding of the resources the work offers for analogical mappings. In the third, I shall explore some of these analogical mappings in a bit more detail, and in the final section, return to correlations between Takamitsu's equinox and Miro's equinox, and to the larger question of the goals and limits of musical analysis. Now, most discussions of analogy begin with similarity, 
since it is the similarity of one situation to another that is the point of departure for any analogy. Similarity judgments, which are allied with processes of categorization, are a basic tool for reasoning. For instance, Marcus Vitruvius Pollio, writing in the first century before the Common Era, shaped an account of how theaters should be cited and designed by noting similarities between the way sound is propagated and the way waves pass through water. Turning to the matter of the best location for a theater, Vitruvius writes, it is also important to note carefully that the site itself not deaden sound. It should be the type in which the voice may travel with the, with the utmost clarity. This can be accomplished if a site is selected where resonances are not impeded. The voice is a flowing breath of air and perceptible to the hearing by its touch. It moves by the endless formation of circles, just as endlessly expanding circles of waves are made in standing water if a stone is thrown into it. These travel outward from the center as far as they can, until some local constriction stands in the way or some other obstacle that prevents the waves from completing their patterns. As soon as these obstacles interfere, the first waves bounce back and upset the patterns. In the same way, the voice makes circular motions. However, on the surface of water, the circles move horizontally, while the voice at once advances horizontally and mounts upward, step by step. For the voice, therefore, just as for the pattern of waves in water, as long as no obstacle interferes with the first wave, it will not upset the second wave or any of those that follow. All of them will reach the ears of the spectators without echoing, those in the lowermost seats as well as those in the highest. Vitruvius builds an analogy between air and water from the simple observation that both can flow from one place to another and thereby touch remote objects. Observing that water can accomplish this through waves emanating from a single source, spreading in a circular fashion, he reasons that air must do something similar. A number of ins inferences then follow. That waves of sound will continue to spread until they meet with some obstacle. That when the waves encounter such an obstacle, they will reflect back and disturb the spreading pattern of waves. And that echoes are a consequence of this sort of reflection. Vitruvius also extends his inferences beyond the model provided by water, proposing that waves of sound emanate both horizontally and vertically, and that vertical waves spread in the same way that horizontal ones do. Inferences of the sort generated by Vitruvius point to what many researchers regard as the defining characteristic of an analogy, the mapping of systematic rela uh, uh, structural relationships between discrete domains. In such a mapping, elements are mapped to elements, relations to relations, and the correspondences between elements and relations within each domain are preserved. In Vitruvius's analogy, water is mapped onto air, the tossed stone onto the impulse of the voice, and the spreading waves of water onto the spreading waves of air. Most importantly, the relationships between the given medium, the physical action on it, and the result are preserved. Analogy is not simply about correlating elements from one domain with elements in another domain, but about mapping relationships between those domains. It is thus often described as concerned with relations among relations, or second-order relations. Vitruvius's analogy correlates the relationship of spreading circular wave to water with the relationship of spreading circular wave to air. One consequence of this mapping is that the notion of a wave gets turned into an abstraction, one that applies equally well to both water and air, and that would, in the 19th century, be applied to electromagnetic radiation. It is worth noting that Vitruvius's analogy is shaped by his goals. There are any number of similarities between water and air. Both can be put in a closed container and moved from place to place. Both are necessary for life. Both remain unscathed if poked with a stick. Both almost certainly belong to the emperor. But Vitruvius focuses on just those features and relations that are relevant to his discussion of the acoustic properties of theaters. The alignment of features and structure that typifies analogy is thus constrained by contextual goals that are distinct from the analogical process proper. Analogies, making analogies is something that is virtually effortless for humans. Motivated by this fact, Douglas Hofstetter has argued that analogy, as the means by which concepts are assembled and connected to one another, is at the very core of human cognition. At the very least, there's considerable overlap between judgments of similarity, 
making analogies, and processes of categorization, all of which contribute to the distinctiveness of human intelligence. Perhaps more striking is that the capacity for analogy is apparently unique to our species. I say apparently because at this point, we simply don't know as much as we might about the analogical capacities of other species. There is, for instance, research suggesting that chimpanzees can understand the second order relations basic to analogy, especially for spatial reasoning. There's also evidence that dolphins have the capacity to for perform analogical mappings of the sort that are necessary for complex motor mimicry. In this photo, the dolphin Alele is imitating the posture of graduate student Amy Miller. Graduate students, take note. Alele uses her raised tail as an analog for Amy's raised leg and spreads her pectoral fins as an analog for Amy's outspread arms. It's worth noting that this behavior on the part of the dolphin is spontaneous. This is not trained, although the dolphins uh, that come out of this particular research are, have been working with humans quite a bit. But this behavior is not part of their training in a sort of explicit, simple way. This evidence notwithstanding, at present it appears that no other species comes close to making or using analogies with the facility and speed of humans. And this capacity is available from a very early age. <clears throat> Children as young as 10 months are able to pr solve problems by analogy, and by the age of three years, analogical abilities are quite robust. The ability to map structure, uh, systematic structural relationships between disparate domains bears witness to a capacity for abstract thought, for thinking about relations between relations of enormous flexibility and wide application. Analogy has been recognized as a key factor in human creativity and has been linked to the conceptual flights of fancy and processes of meaning construction created through metaphor and metonymy. For my part, I've argued that the conceptual domains involved in such mappings need not be restricted to those involving language, an argument supported by the capacity for analogy demonstrated by primates, dolphins, and prelinguistic children. Now there's a category. <clears throat> The short answer to the question of how we can connect musical sounds with, the image, uh, with images is that we as humans can scarce do otherwise. Analogies involved in our most mundane observations as well as our most profound. There is, however, a somewhat longer answer to this question that addresses an issue passed over in my initial account of correspondences between Takamitsu's composition and Miro's etching. I noted that one could map uh, could match the rapid flourish of measure four with one of the curving lines at the center of the etching. What is easily missed, what is in truth obscured by our reliance on musical notation, is that the mapping here is between a sequence of sounds unfolding over time and a static image. Put another way, the shape described by the music, if we even want to anchor our characterization of this sequence to the disposition of objects in space, is a thoroughly dynamic one whereas the image is dynamic only to the extent that we activate it through our reading of the image or through our memory of the physical processes through which such images are produced. Let me draw this out by considering the mapping in a bit more detail. The musical flourish sets out a general trajectory upwards through the frequency spectrum, with the pitches of the main section of the tra trajectory before it terminates in a leap, separated from one another by the interval of three semitones. <coughs> Given this arrangement, the pitches can be heard to coalesce into the familiar sonorities of a fully diminished seventh chord or, with the sustained pitches at the conclusion of the flourish, a dominant seventh chord. And the whole is to be per performed with a crescendo from piano to mezzo forte. In the case of the etching, the line has a down-up orientation emerging from the solid block of color at the bottom of the image and with enough of a curve at the top to reverse the direction of the line. Given our habits of reading such images, we tend to read the line as a single whole, even though its boundaries in the bottom portion of the etching are indistinct, as are its edges when it crosses other lines. And the line thins after its curving change of direction. Again, it is the second order relations, the mapping between the features of the flourish and the line from the etching that are particularly important and which make analogy a significant resource for the construction of meaning and knowledge. They also highlight a seeming mismatch in that a crescendo involves the production of an increasing amount of sound, correlating it with a line that thins seems counterintuitive. And yet if we think of the gesture behind the line Producing the curve and termination of the line might well require an, an acceleration of motion analogous to the increase in energy required by a crescendo. 
The centrality to musical expression of dynamic processes such as the one I have just described is one of the reasons I myself am skeptical about some of the other correlations between music and image that I noted earlier. Yes, we can match the brief high register chordal clusters of measures one and two with celestial bodies and the low register oscillating figure with the horizon. But what is far more important to me is the extent to which the sequence of musical events set out by Takamitsu in the opening measures activates Miro's etching, causing the sun and moon to float over an undulating horizon. What music offers to analogical mappings, then, is a resource for capturing the dynamic aspect of phenomena through sequences of organized sound. The potential for sequences of, of musical sound to function as sonic analogs for dynamic processes points to two significant differences between music and language, differences which have profound implications for our understanding of music. These differences concern the kind of reference used by each form of communication and the basic function of these modes in human cultures. At its core, music exploits a form of reference markedly different from that of language. I should say at the outset that I'm using a rather broad notion of reference, one that draws on C.S. Peirce's initial formulations of semiotics rather than later derivations, almost all of which are focused exclusively on language. Especially important is Peirce's discussion of the icon and his distinctions between the image, diagram, and metaphor. These different types are distinguished by the structural relationship between the sign and its object. Building on research on analogy, I call this relationship analogical reference. So the important thing to me here is less Peirce's terms. Um, I understand metaphor is something different than how he's characterizing it, but rather he's locating these things as being um, the image as being almost an exact replica of the thing that's being, uh, that, that is being referred to, whereas the metaphor is very vague. In my own work, I actually locate these much more along a, a continuum rather than the sort of discrete tripartite structures which even Peirce himself realized he was obsessed with. Although there are certainly cases in which structural similarities between sign and object are so profound that one might mistake the icon for the thing it represents, the relationship is typically much looser, as the case in which a simple line drawing is used to refer to a twisting, winding road. One of the limitations of analogical reference, then, is the need for conformance between the sign and its object. One of its advantages is its relative immediacy, keeping in mind that this immediacy relies on a capacity for making analogies that appears to be unique to our species. Language, by contrast, makes use of symbolic reference, in which the relationship between the sign and the thing to which it refers is completely arbitrary. Julianne, I saw you here someplace. Yeah, you're, she's responsible for this, so if you don't like this, you have to uh, blame her. Um, um, because um, the, form of, the form symbolic tokens uh, take is thus virtually unlimited. They can be as simple or as complex as we like, but they can be completely opaque to those unfamiliar with the system of signs of which they are a part. The ideas about the different forms of reference exploited by music and language point to one reason why every known human culture has developed both. Put simply, they have different functions in human cultures. My thinking about the cultural role of communicative media is influenced by the work of the developmental psychologist Michael Tomasello, who situates the emergence of language in our species within the broader development of human culture. In Tomasello's view, the primary function of language is to direct the attention of another person to objects or concepts within a shared referential frame. I would argue that music is similarly part of a cultural framework unique to our species, but one whose primary function is to represent through pattern sound various dynamic processes that are common in human experience. Chief among these dynamic processes are those associated with the, motion, the emotions, which, following recent work by Antonio Damasio, can be construed as sequences of physiological and psychological events that subtend feelings, and the movements of bodies, including our own, through space. Before going further, I should emphasize that these thoughts about the function of language and music in human cultures is focused on the primary function of each. But language and music clearly have other functions within human culture. In the case of music, either musical or non-musical events can prompt us to step back from our engagement with the dynamic processes analogized through sound and come, become aware of the means through which this engagement is accomplished. In such cases, reflection on musical objects replaces engagement with musical processes, and something closer to the sort of communication we associate with language commences. 
If it is the case that the kind of reference exploited by music and language are different, and correlate with this, if they have different primary functions in human cultures, then it stands to reason that their syntactic structure will be different. Well, perhaps stands to reason is too strong. If syntax is regarded as a set of abstract structures that has no relationship to the function of communicative media, it is quite reasonable to assume that the syntax of music and the syntax of language will be the same. But if syntax exists in order to realize the function of a communicative medium, and this is the perspective adopted by those working on the cognitive grammar of language, then it is reasonable to assume that the syntax of music and the syntax of language will be markedly different. It may well be that the view of syntactic structure I've just introduced is unfamiliar to you, and I'm not sure I could convince you that it is the correct one without a, lexi ex uh, uh, without a rather lengthy excursus uh, into my ideas about uh, musical grammar. What I think I can do, however, is suggest how such a view might inform our understanding of music, and especially our analyses of music. To do this, I'd like to take a closer look at the musical materials of Takamitsu's Equinox, and once you're familiar with these, show you how they can serve as analogs for dynamic processes. This closer look will, for good or ill, require the sort of reflection on musical objects I mentioned a moment ago, which will lead us away from a view of music as engaged with dynamic processes and toward one in which the emphasis is on the raw materials of musical expression. What I'm ultimately interested in, however, are the compositional strategies through which Takamitsu activates these materials, that is, how he creates dynamic musical structures out of them. Now, one resource that Takamitsu often exploited in his compositions was octatonic pitch collections. Although we can understand such collections as coming from an eight-note scale made up of alternating whole and half steps, the octatonic scale is rare, itself is rarely in evidence, and what we more typically find are prominent pitch structures that could be traced, in whole or in part, back to the scale. One example occurs in the melody of measures 19 and 20, the four notes of which make up an 0235 type tetrachord. <clears throat> a four-note collection strongly associated with octatonic scales. This collection is expanded to an 0236 type tetrachord in the melody of measure 21, and which then appears transposed and inverted in the topmost notes of the sequence of chords in measures 22 and 23. A reverse of this process occurs in measures 29 through 30. There, the 0236 type tetrachord occurs first as the melodic profile of a sequence of chords, and then with a reprise of the music of measure 21 as a straightforward melody. <clears throat> Returning for a moment to this sequence of chords um, from measures 22 and 23, taken as a whole, these are almost purely octatonic. The one exception is the low B2, which is also the note that is held over when the chord at the end of measure 22 is restated with its notes reshuffled around in measure 23. Before leaving this sequence of chords, it should be pointed out that Takamitsu has singled it out for special attention. Exactly the same sequence this is with the same dynamic profile and timbre occurs in measure 5 near the opening of the piece and in measure 80 near the end. Another sequence to which Takamitsu draws attention occurs first in measure 7. The arpeggiated figure with which the measure begins is transposed down three half steps in the second half of the measure, reinforcing the prominence of the figure. In measures 9 and 10, the whole of these pitch materials is repeated, but now beginning a half step higher and with a slight extension of the arpeggio. What is perhaps most important to my ear is the very beginning of the figure, which is brought back in measures 33 and 34, and also again in measures 73 and 74. The pitches of this portion of the figure can be classed as an 0134 type tetrachord, which is perhaps a more prominent signifier of octatonic collections than our 0235 type tetrachords. I should point out, however, that the figure as a whole is not strictly octatonic, but rather leans in that direction. This is also true of measures 6 and 8 much of the and much of the surrounding material. Although octatonic references are prominent, the music is not, by any stretch of the imagination, strictly octatonic. The practice of using octatonic collections in this fashion, that is, as a resource rather than as a primary organizing principle, points to one of the limitations of fully symmetrical collections. They lack the irregularities in intervallic structure that make diatonic collections such a powerful resource for tonal orientation. Lest I give the impression that the pitch materials of Equinox are concerned only with octatonic or near-octatonic collections, let me point to a couple of passages in which other materials come to the fore. The first is in measures 24 through 27. 
<clears throat> one tetrachord that crops up in these measures is an 0157 type. That's the very first collection of four notes with the two harmonics uh, at the beginning of it. Um, the second chord is an 0237 type. Neither fit happily within an octatonic framework, and given the strongly octatonic music that precedes and follows these measures, they sound as a marked departure from that sound world. The second passage occurs in uh, measures 42 through 45, and is partially reprised in measures 66 and 67. This music inhabits a domain that is strongly reminiscent of G minor, or, to put it another way, offers near-tonal materials that stand in contrast to the predominantly octatonic music with which they are surrounded. The brief summary of the pitch materials of Takamitsu's equinox that I've just offered should have helped to establish a few of the important landmarks within the terrain of the piece. What I'd now like to do is consider more carefully how Takamitsu activates these materials to create a kind of narrative, a narrative not of objects and relations, but of dynamic processes. Let me begin with the opening of the work. As was drawn out in my initial comments, what we hear first is a registrally and timbrally isolated chord followed by an arpeggiated figure in a lower register. The whole of these materials then dissolve toward silence. This succession of events is then repeated with variation in measures two and three. What is important to the view I would like to develop here is this very fact of repetition. To the extent that we hear repetition in the opening of the work, we hear successive occurrences of equivalent constructions. That is, a dynamic process through which musical elements recur. More broadly, repetition can be conceived as an analog for cyclic processes. Cyclic processes can suggest nested hierarchical structures, but they can also suggest staticity or stagnation, that is, the negation of process. When similar figures appear beginning in measure 11, and that's not on, on this slide, obviously, there's a sense both of returning to something heard earlier and to a, a set of dynamic processes experienced earlier. In between, there's the more energetic and overtly octatonic music of measures 6 through 10, which, of course, offer their own species of repetition, one that seems rather more mechanical than the repetitions of measures 1 through 3 or measures 11 through 15. The overall dynamic process being modeled in the first 15 measures is, quite simply, departure and return. But I would emphasize that geography here is determined not by things, but by processes. The first process sets out musical materials which are held together not through pitch replication or timbre, as was the sequence of three chords, or even consistency of intervallic materials, as in the case of the music that makes clear reference to octatonic collections but through rhythmic figuration and the pitch contour of the arpeggio. The second process introduces materials that stand in contrast to the first group of materials, but that also seem to emerge organically from them. Here's those measures again. A similar process plays out in measures 19 through 31, but here affected through relatively specific arrangements of pitch materials. As noted in my survey of the pitch materials of Equinox, measures 19 through 21, um, measures 19 through 21 as a whole are about as pure an octatonic collection as you'll find. The only odd note out is the B that occurs in the last two chords. Again, attention is drawn to the octatonic domain by the repetition of melodies organized around tetrachords strongly associated with octatonic collections, and by the correlation of these melodies with the modified sequence of three chords. 
Measures 24 through 26, the lovely interlude in which harmonics play such a prominent role, are decidedly not octatonic. They are also quite static, and any hint of melody seems to have disappeared. Beginning in measure 27, however, pitch materials with strong octatonic affiliations and melodic materials begin to reappear until we return to the overtly octatonic material of measures 30 and 31. The overall process, then, is roughly analogous to what occurs in measures 1 through 15. A frame of reference is established, here involving pitch structures that refer to octatonic collections. Contrasting materials make a departure from this framework, more sudden here than occurs in measures 4 through 6. And there is then a return to the pre-established frame of reference, here occurring more gradually, but also more forcefully, forcefully than in measures 10 and 11. Here's beginning in measure 19. A third instance of, the of this compositional strategy plays out over the course of measures 35 through 39. In the interests of space, um, I, I've just given you 34 through 46 here. Measures 35 through, through 41 are dominated by pitch material that's almost completely octatonic, but the distribution of the material is not uniform. Up to measure 39, there's almost complete saturation. The passage includes seven of the eight notes of an octatonic scale. But these materials begin to be reduced in measures 40 and 41, a reduction coincident with a slowing down of pitch onsets. As I observed earlier, measures 42 through 46 are mostly diatonic. That is, they're decidedly not octatonic, and in contrast to the relentless push of measures 35 through 39, are quite sparse. The ascending sequence that begins in measure 47 then brings a return to the octatonic materials, emphasized by the repetition of each successive measure a minor third higher. The overall process is again similar to those which occurred earlier, but is also a bit more diffuse. What measures 35 through 41 establish and what measures 47 through 49 recover is a frame of reference for pitch relationships organized around octatonic collections. Measures 42 through 46, through their focus on diatonic materials, depart from this frame of reference. That is, they do the musical equivalent of stepping outside it, if only for a brief moment. Here's the pickup to measure 35, beginning in measure 34. It's a long pickup. Let's tie that again. just a little bit long, uh, farther, but I wanted to, I have something else to say about that. I should want to acknowledge that I do not find the account of dynamic processes I've just offered to be completely satisfying, not least because I've chosen to paint my scene quickly and with broad brush strokes. I want to emphasize, however, that it is possible to be quite specific about the ways musical materials provide sonic analogs for dynamic processes. One example of such specificity emerged in my account of the correlation between the flourish of measure four and the curving line in Moreau's etching. Another example is prompted by one of my favorite moments in Equinox, the expanded flourishes that appear in um, measures 32 through 34. 
I observed earlier that these passages make reference in a fragmentary form to the 0134 type tetrachords and sequential music of measures 7 through 11. Each of these fragmentary references is preceded by an ascending run in 16th notes, and in each case, the 0134 type tetrachord serves as a point of arrival, arresting the sense of forward motion generated by the run and reversing its contour. Here's measure 32. One more time with that, just so you get the sense of it. Together, these materials give a strong sense of forward motion. That is, they provide a sonic analog for the dynamic process of moving quite deliberately from one place to another. The effect is no accident. Note that the pitch compass of each successive run grows smaller, spanning first two octaves, then a perfect 11, then a major tenth. As a correlate of this compression, each successive arrival point is lower in pitch, falling from A to G to E. Together, all of these materials seem to be moving towards some goal, which is, of course, the commencement of the measured and primarily octatonic music that begins in measure 35. By way of conclusion, let me return to John Miro's, Miro's Equinox, the engraving that inspired Takemitsu's composition. I think an argument can be made that, through the various sorts of departures and returns that Takemitsu explores throughout the piece, returns that throughout the work are never exact, but more like vague reminiscences, the musical work draws out some of the ambivalence of the etching. By ambivalence here, I don't mean that Miro was not sure about what he was doing, but rather that competing and indeed simultaneous interpretations are part and parcel of the etching, whether they pertain to the distinction between the figure and what it is perceiving, to the relationship of the celestial bodies to one another in the earth, or to the difficulty of reading clear emotions from the face of the figure. What I do not think is drawn out as strongly is the sexual charge of the etching. Indeed, when the Tristan chord is cited in measure 52 of Takamitsu's Equinox, that's that arrival chord that I just played a minute ago, that's the Tristan chord, downbeat of 52, it is almost, but not quite, innervated, a remembrance of erotic energy rather than the enactment of it. This does not, I think, mean that Takamitsu's piece is totally lacking in such energy. It's in, in its intimacy and silences, there's certainly the potential to hear a subdued but still recognizable eros. But it does not seem to be as front and center as it is in Miro's etching. Although I've argued that on the whole, the etching is of necessity rather more static than the musical composition, Miro did conceive of his abstract works as having a strong affiliation with music. Speaking of the series of 23 paintings given the overall title Constellations, completed during the early years of the Second World War, Miro observed that the abstract spirit of these works was directly related to his experience of what he viewed as the private, non-particularized language of music. I felt a deep desire to escape, Miro said of this period sometime later. I closed within myself purposely. The night, music, and stars began to play a major role in suggesting my paintings. Music had always appealed to me, and now music in this period began to take the role poetry had played in the early 20s. Thus, in the play of color and shape in Moreau's etching, which of course is from quite a bit later period than Constellations, we might see analogs for a variety of different dynamic processes. Where music differs, of course, is that its very substance is organized around providing sonic analogs for such dynamic processes. I took the title of my talk from Borges of exactitude in science, because I believe one of the frustrating things about the perspective that I've given you here is that there's not a lot of precision in these analogical mappings. They don't seem to have the substance, the clarity, the crispness of even my somewhat tedious but still fairly formalized octatonic reading of Takamitsu's piece. And yet, I would actually like to argue that this difficulty is not something that because of the limitations of musical analysis, but rather instead because the kinds of correlations we're trying to draw are correlations for which language is but a poor substitute. Diagrams and static images can only get us so far with this. And so part of what I'm actually arguing for is that in the same way that Borges's people eventually gave up 
their point-to-point -point map, that music analysts in some ways need to surrender some of the notion of a point-to-point -point capturing of the musical work. And in doing so, we might well come to the point of Carol's imaginative character and think of music in the same way. We now use the country itself as its own map, and I assure you that it does nearly as well. Thank you. There might just be one or two questions. Yes, sir. I have a question. You seem to end by almost suggesting that there's a kind of structure for affect in the responses to music and in the responses to visual art that you can make analogs with. But you didn't really mention affect. Do you want to care to, to bring that into play in, in what you were trying to say? I did mention affect briefly when I was talking, uh, when I um, gave you my notion of one of the primary functions of music within human cultures, and that is actually to provide analogs for different dynamic processes. And in my understanding, and again, there's, this is a whole field of research, which there's a lot of contestation about, but within research on emotion, there's, I think there's quite a few viewpoints that would view emotions as dynamic processes so that you can actually look at the physiological and psychological succession of events and see that an emotion is not a static thing. Anger is not simply that word, but it's actually a dynamic process which unfolds over a time loop, and uh, time loop uh, over an actual time contour. There's a shape to that particular thing. My proposal is simply that music can serve as an analog for that. Now, in this, I actually am at a somewhat of a departure to some of my colleagues who want to argue for the direct induction of emotions by music. I actually believe, I have, that's, I, I've written about 40 pages of the present book on that, trying to explain why, why I think there's limitations to that. Um, and, and so, in other words, on the one hand, I'm taking the escape hatch of, oh, it's too complicated. Uh, but on the other hand, it is too complicated, but the um, but what I would the basic argument that I would make then is that music can serve as an analog for emotional states, but that again these analogs need to be interpreted within a framework. They're not for free, and so it's not necessarily the case that the way one culture interprets the emotional valence of a particular piece of music will be absolutely transparent to another culture. That's been maintained by a variety of researchers, but at least the research research that I've seen does not bear that out. And unfortunately, there's just not as much cross-cultural research on that as we might like. Again, it depends on your data and what you're, what you're doing. Other people might be more convinced by that. I'm, I'm at present not convinced by that, the sense that we can listen to South Asian music and feel the exact same emotions as someone from that uh, culture. I, I'm not convinced by that. Ah, now this is interesting. One of the tropes that comes out is music is the language of the emotions or music is all about emotions and that sort of thing. I'm actually very skeptical of that because you don't have to read very far in the research on emotion to find out that emotions are a basic response to changes in the environment. And so the notion that we look at a sculpture and we have an emotional reaction to that of some sort, maybe I don't care, but it might be a whole range of other things. And so the idea that music is special in this regard, I actually count to the fact that music appears to be invisible and transparent and thus internal, as are the emotions. So there is that very strong correlation between them. Um, and then the other, um, the other aspect is that because of this kind of ephemerality and difficulty, that's why we can do that mapping very readily. But I've also talked to mathematicians that get pretty excited about different equations. Um, and again, for me, that, let's just say that doesn't happen as often, but the notion that you could have an emotional response to something, I would not, want to, I, I would not make the argument to some people that music is, oh, ever so much better. I think it's easier to make the correlations in certain cases, but in other cases, maybe not. But, so that's, I'm sorry, that's a sort of roundabout way, but to sum up, I would say that um, music, because it's involved with dynamic processes and because emotions are also part of that, that those kinds of mappings are good. I also think that language can 
activate some of these things. Finally, the last thing I'd say is I painted a caricature here. Language is over here, music is there. Language can make use of analogical processes, and work that's been done on prosody points this out very clearly. And music can occasionally uh, strive, get to the symbolic state of language, but for the most part, I see them as using different forms of reference, and that's, that's where I separate them. Eric, you had a question. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of nervous here. I, I have to do analysis which sort of went beyond my uh, Well, well sorry, go for the music. You know about that, man. Yeah, yeah. And, you presented your music with this picture in the background. Mm -hmm. How is that music going to be if I don't have that picture as a reference? It's going to be like when I play in concert or other situations. That's, no, so that's not an answer. So, but in other words, what that's... What I'm saying is that the, the, the whole presentation of the analogy base is, has been skewed a bit yep. in this particular presentation. Right. And yet, presumably, what you're getting at is we don't know what the artist intended. Necessarily, I mean, it wasn't broadcast necessarily. Time right. it's a had his interpretation, of right? That. And then he presented music, which in your original sort of monolithic expression, music is a sonic, thing, yeah, like sonic animal sort of thing. Um, what do you do when you then back out of multi multi modal experience? Well, this is the one thing that uh, again here I draw on some of Nick Cook's work on. Um, the uh, multimedia um, and analyzing musical multimedia. And I actually think that there's, um, I'm, I'm actually myself nervous about the notion that there's sort of pure music um, in that sort of unsullied way um, in that fashion. But what I wanted to do here was actually really put two things together with the hope that there would be some tension between them rather than simply mapping one onto well, the other. I'm sure that I pulled out a specific dimensionality of roughly number three mm -hmm. because I had you saying one of the three lines and then everything started breaking in, well, coupling in right, right, right. right. And I saw that in, in the inventions that were right. some things that kept coming back. Right. Now, I, would, I don't know if I would have caught that if I. And again, I think I, what I actually think is that that kind of thing suggests really how there's a lot more in this music that can be heard and drawn out than just from this particular correlation. But I was using this as sort of diagnostic for that. But for instance, those people in the room who are either, you know, Wagnerists or you've just been, you're a music theorist, so you've been around the Tristan chord so much, as soon as they hear that particular chord, which is in register and everything else, it's like bing, 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 bing. Um, and not only that, but Takamitsu uses this a lot of times in his pieces. So if you know Takamitsu's music, you're just going, Tristan Chord, you know, and then it came, right? Um, that sort of thing. What I find is interesting here is how um, that uh, I hear a correspondence between the F sharp harmonic in the immediately preceding measure and that one. And so that here, the Tristan Chord, rather than being the beginning of something, is a reminiscence of memory and things like that. And so it's interesting to me how Takamitsu has really changed that. But that's a lot of embedded knowledge. And so I'm kind of working back and forth here between things that are relatively easy to do analogical mappings from and then the cultural knowledge that, that might embed and constrain us. Or just the immediacy of whatever Right, right. And I think that's something that's important. Here's one thing, though, that I will say is that what I'm especially interested in is where there are constraints. And that's what I was trying to push out, pu point out with when I was showing this, uh, Trent Leipert especially was just, and he knows a lot of this, uh, this, rep this repertoire, the visual repertoire, much better than do I. He pointed out the strongly sexual imagery of this. One of the other students knew a Hart Crane poem, which is almost like a direct interpretation of this. And it's also, it's actually one of Hart Crane's real heterosexual reference things. And so you could, he, it's a fantastic poem because it's almost like a direct interpretation of that. I don't hear that in Takamitsu's music. And so if someone were to say, oh, that music's all about this real sexuality, I'd say, you probably play it different than I do. I'm not, I'm not getting that in that piece. And they might be able to work it out. I, I just, I haven't, that's not, that's not my interpretation of it. There is, Michael, I know you, Michael, go ahead and then we'll uh, go behind. You. Well, I was just going to say that, um, you know, at the beginning of the talk, you set up a discourse about analogy, and you made a strong case for it being a very universal procedure. Mm -hmm. And then the repertoire is so specific, so I said, <coughs> even though I'm a trained musician, uh, the octatonic connections are not the first things that, that, would, that would occur to me. So, right. you know, thanks for pointing them out. But how would it look if you, how would it look if you did the same exercise using the folk song? 
Um, it would depend on the folk song. Well, let's take. Oh no, 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 but no, but but let me no, but let me get back to let me get no, let me get back to the actual uh, the thing because I. Yeah, I didn't come to this piece and go, oh, octatonic. I mean, yeah, I know Takamitsu uses octatonics. That wasn't what I was looking for. This was part of an, uh, uh, drawing out an analytical project. What for me was important, and this is something where this talk, it's a limitation of this particular talk, is I wanted to be somewhat specific. I didn't want to say, oh, well, that music's kind of like this, and that music's kind of like I wanted to at least be able to anchor it so someone could go back and see if those structures are there and, and check it out. Now, now the, the, uh, just to finish off my thought, the main passage for me that if it worked, then part of my argument is successful, and if it didn't, uh, I've got to rethink it, is the m music from Measure 19 yeah. on in that. If you hear 24, 25, even into 26, if you hear that as being in a different space, yeah. then the analytical part of my argument would be getting some traction, because then I could say, hey, I'm a music theorist, that's octatonic, that's not, that sort of thing. And so I'm actually more concerned with that kind of contrast between those sound worlds rather than the characterization of them. Because as I mentioned, this is not strictly octatonic, even to that matter. It's just making reference to that. So now going to a folk song, um, I've just been playing one that I want to play for, uh, for Remembrance Day. My, the recital I'm doing happens on November 11th. So I was looking for something to play, and it's not easy, especially on guitar. So I, I settled on The Flowers of the Forest, which is often used for, uh, for uh, 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 military memorials. Um, and that piece is very interesting. Haydn did a setting of it, which is quite revealing. The piece overall is really straightforward and diatonic except the second section, which goes into a Mixolydian reference. And so in that sense, I hear that section in a very rough analogy, and that's a, that's a folk piece that goes back 16th century or something like that, as inhabiting a different sound world in that particular section, and it has to do with the pitch collections in part that are being deployed and that sort of thing. Now, I don't need the terms diatonic, Mixolydian. I don't need those terms to understand that as a musician. I don't need that, but again, I can then use some of those things to make connections between other musical uh, works and that sort of thing. And that to me is where the, rele uh, the relevance of those things. So I want to be careful. In all this technical stuff I was doing, I think that's there. If anybody wants, if, you know, the music theorist nerds want to get together, we can argue about the different octatonic yeah. kinds of things. But I'm more interested in the sets of pitch references that are involved. Well, I just want to make yeah. one comment, which yeah. is that this, the Takamitsu piece has so much complexity and levels of salience that just depend on you know, who you are and, and, and so yeah. And if you want to make, uh, for me, uh, the idea of using a much simpler and more common language musical material to make the point about analogy and to, to, to sort of make the corners cut clearer, then, then that would help. No, I think, I think that's a good case. At the same time, as you know from some of my earlier work, I, made, I do make the argument that pieces of music teach us how to listen to them. Yeah. And I think that in that section on Measure 19, Takamitsu is teaching us in the moment there, how to listen at that point. He keeps repeating that thing, and then he expands it, and then he throws it up into the melody of the chords. And then I'll go someplace else, hey, that thing I just taught you, it's back, right? And so that to me is the kind of process. I agree that that happens in other repertoires, but I just find it exciting when in as dense and as complex a piece like this, the composer, composer's kind of putting his arm around me saying, hey, here's, here's how we go through this. And that, to me, as a performer, but also as someone thinking about this, is, is an interesting moment. If, as I quite agree, I've only scraped a little bit of surface. There was one question here, and then I'll go. It's one mine is super naive, but I think it does actually tie in with it. Well, again, well, 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 his question is: yes. I'm not sure what you mean by naive questions. I'm not sure what it means to say that questions are are they non-naive questions? Um, the what the, the um, use of the adjective in that case is to highlight parametric change, right? So that, for instance, I can think of um, when my car is idling at about 750 or 800 RPM, that's definitely a process. But if it's just sitting there, right, and yeah, it's dynamic, I know about you know, the 800 RPMs, and I know about all those things. But there's an aspect of it where there's very little parametric change within that, and so I'm not seeing, thinking it as dynamic as when I step on the gas and the tachometer pounces up to 2,000, right? 
And so what I'm trying to highlight with that adjective is parametric change over time. That's what I'm trying to so I, I, this is this is what I'm this is kind of the deep question behind that. Yeah. Is like how much how much technical apparatus do you need to make the point? Is this just the point about sort of the basic nature of music? Because it's a thing that exists over time. Is that the analogic process? Ah. Music exists over time, but Morse code exists over time. In other words, what I'm trying to get at is not simply sound processes that are existing over time, but the, the specific resources that music brings. That's what I'm trying to, to tease out and get to. So there could be, um, there could be a, a sound-based art form that is music. There could be an essentially process-based art form didn't have this knowledge at all. So in cultures? I don't know. I'm trying to I'm trying to develop something which is really broad and doesn't necessarily assume a Western music perspective. Is it kind of a continued feature of Western music? No, 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 no. No. Most most of my uh, not most. There's quite a few of my examples that are drawn from other So it's kind of a central feature of music per se. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll be I'll be that up front, so but again, right? But again, part of part of the issue that I'm trying to what I'm trying to explore here is understanding. Uh, going back to that question, why have human cultures developed both language and music? You know, why? If music is doing the exact same thing as language, what for? You know, what do you need it for, right? And if it's doing something different, let's try to be specific about what that is. That's what I'm aim, at least trying to aim toward. With the notion that then, um, following the work of cognitive linguists, then trying to build a grammar off of, in part, what that function is and align those functions with different forms. So that's the project. It's a modest little thing. I just think, <laughs> yes. Well, your paper was in the context of the expressive performance series. Uh, uh, yes. At the beginning of your talk, you mentioned uh, well, some sort of cognitive science approaches and your own work and so on. So mm -hmm. my question is, uh, your conclusion seemed, perhaps I could have some sort of bit resignative, mm -hmm. not, not too optimistic. In other words, my perhaps provocative question is, mm -hmm. what do you see as a sort of surplus value in you know, sort of Marxian terms, a uh, surplus value of your approach and your, your perspectives, your possibilities of finding out things as uh, opposed to sort of older approaches in uh, music analysis, in hermeneutics, in interpretation, because you said at the end, you know, this inter interpretive range was quite broad. And uh, as far as I understand that correctly, uh, at least as a credo and as an aim in the cognitive sciences, they try at least to narrow that. Right, right. Um, uh, a, a good question, and I don't know how many parts of it I'll be able to um, address, so remind me of sections that I, that I forget in my response to you. Um, part of what I'm trying to do here, part of the overall project, really has to do with um, trying to come up with analytical systems that I think better fit what I understand is actually happening in music. And my frustration with some of the analytical methods that are, that are there, now it's a frustration, it's not an anger or, or anything else, is simply that oftentimes what's happening is, is music is being forced into particular boxes because of the limitations of language and limitations of that kind of approach. And so I actually see a kind of dissonance between those things. The other thing is, is, is that um, in the, the book that Richard was kind enough to mention, Conceptualizing Music, part of what the argument of that book was is it is possible to have non-linguistic concepts, right? Which is actually, you can talk to some people, and my, some of my colleagues in philosophy would say, what? Um, and um, I want, actually want to develop that argument. Well, part of this is understanding how music would participate in a conceptual way. And one thing that I've become convinced of is that music doesn't... Um, have concepts in the exact same fashion that language does. And so one of those differences has to do with this problematic notion of a dynamic process, something that's occurring over time. Now, language can make use of this, right? I mean, how does a horse go? It goes clip clop, clip clop. It's onomatopoeia. It also happens to be that's not only the sound a horse makes according to the OED, that's the sound of a fisherman's clogs on cobblestones. Um, and on the one hand, um, there is a kind of mapping between, between 
the sound that you make with, your, with the words and the actual sound of a horse or a fisherman's clogs. On the other hand, it's not exact. A horse doesn't really sound clip-clop, clip-clop, but the alternation of vowels captures that sort of thing. So we can do these kinds of things, but language has not been organized around that kind of reference to the same extent that music has been. And so what I think I'm trying to offer is not only saying I see some limitations with modes of musical analysis that are trying to treat music as something it's not, um, you know, as something it's objects and relations and just that sort of thing. That's pretty strong, but I think I can... Um, at least, I studied with Alan Ford at Yale, and those of you who know Alan's work know that Alan is pretty cut and dried quite a bit of the time. Um, and so, uh, in, in part, it's a reaction to that, but it's also trying to do something um, that actually suggests why the problems are there and where we might go otherwise. So in terms of surplus value, hey, every analyst believes he or she is right. It's part of the nature of the business. But what I am trying to do is capture something that's closer to um, my experience of music. Unfortunately, as soon as I say my experience of music, that puts it in a domain that I'm the expert in. Uh, but I really do mean that in a sense of trying to get as close a match as possible. So for me, I guess the surplus value is almost more personal in a way, but I do think that this enables me to get at music and repertoires that I couldn't get at otherwise. So that's the main thing. Yes? I'm surprised that you didn't um, make a little more of the celestial uh, aspect of the, both the painting and the music, because your musical analysis, it seemed to me, was right on with the equinox, the, with the cyclical aspect of it, right. and the sort of ethereal, um, in space mm -hmm. aspect. Right. And I was wondering why you didn't exploit that. I think the main reason was is I wasn't drawn to that image in a really powerful way. In other words, I think that there could be a really good analysis from that. Uh, again, um, the point was made to me that the equinox is also within certain cultures as a time of different rituals being practiced in that way. And so one might then draw out the ritual aspect. There are additional complications because, I, um, at least in my understanding, Miro's work was really caught favor in Japan in the late 1960s. And so I think that Takamitsu was part of a, a group of people who really found an attraction to aspects of that music. So I think a lot more can be done. But for me, the resonance of the, the, um, the celestial bodies, for whatever reason, wasn't as strong as some of this sense of pushing back and forth. And I did find that what Charles Palermo gave me, which is this notion that this is both the figure viewing and, and what the figure is seeing, and that kind of flipping back and forth, that's more something that I think is underneath the Takamitsu. And so that's so I was basically responding to that. But I wouldn't want to deny that there's other equally interesting um, things that you might be able to draw out of this. As Michael suggested, it's a really dense piece. There's a lot, uh, lot in there. But that's what, it, I mean, actually the celestial aspect, I didn't even look at anything mm -hmm. except the picture and the right. to the music and look at the right. score at all. And to me, that was, it was like the music of the spheres. Right. Right. Again, I think what can happen is, is although that might, there might be someone else coming along saying, oh, well, that's just an arbitrary thing. What I tried to point out in my one set of correlations, and I'm not wedded to the notion that that flourish, flourish is the line, but rather that when you do those mappings, if you dig into the music, you can actually find a lot of correspondences. And that gets back to your question as well. This actually makes me take these analogical mappings seriously, because then you look into the actual organization of the music and find out how many correlations there are, and that's really the strength of the mapping. You've been very patient back there. Um, uh, my question, uh, I'm not a musicologist or anything like that. That's a good question. I mean, you, you can but, speak all night after listening to a piece like this. And so, uh, just uh, forgive if uh, this is a bit crude. And so, but um, one side of the, the analogy discussion that I was wondering uh, if you could talk a bit more about is the performative side of both the music and in terms of simply you're pr producing this for us uh, or performing it for us, as well as the um, my understanding of images in that when we're looking at them, we can we also have to understand that an artist has sat down and painted it, and so right. there's this heavy-handedness about the bottom half of the painting right. and a lighter element, or uh, that there's certainly weightedness towards uh, just simply the the way in which this product was produced. And I think I'm wondering if there's some analogical mappings that can be made between those two performative strategies, between 
uh, doing harmonics and the lighter ethereal, the light handedness of a harmonic and the light handedness of the, the painting strategies. Mm -hmm. Is there, is that? No, I, th I think it's, I think it's possible. And I think unfortunately my response will, will have to be also, you know, painting, painting very broadly because it's a broad, broad question that you ask. But I think for me, the difference is first off, I accept exactly what you say that you know, with any of these artworks, we read them. And so at least if I go to the Art Institute in Chicago, I'm constantly conscious of how artists are leading, and how an artist is leading my eye across the painting in particular ways. I'm really, and then I try to fight against it and do other things. And sometimes I see things that I wouldn't see otherwise when I'm reacting to that. But there's, there really is that component. And I think it's something that I know some of my colleagues in art history are starting to get interested in, but it's, it's not something that there's been a lot of discussion about, in part because cognitive science hasn't quite known how to, how to work with some of these eye movements and the readings and those things. As we get a better understanding of the embodied nature of human cognition, I think that those will get a better understanding of that kind of thing. The difference for me with music is that whether you like it or not, I'm going to play this note, and then I'm going to play that note, and I'm going to play that note. And so your reading of the piece in that way, for good or ill, is constrained by my production or misproduction of notes in some ways. And so although you might be able to read this in certain ways, and Miro might have pushed us in certain ways of the reading, with the piece of music, you only have the sonic stream that I'm producing at that particular time. So that's the different limitation for me. And in part, I, I want to accept that as a limitation, but then also, being a musician, think of it as a resource. What does it get me um, in that kind of thing? That's where the memory aspect of this piece is very interesting to me, how Takamitsu will recall things back. And he wants to recall them not as an exact thing. Sometimes he wants to reintroduce them as a memory. And when you think of that in a painting, the correlation between that and a painting, you realize that that's a, a different layer of interpretation to think, to look at a painting and see the representation of one part of the painting in a memory of the other part, you know, those, those kinds of things. All of a sudden you can feel that there's a, a, there's a kind of rub there, the fit isn't very good. And so that's one thing to make very clear. There's limitations to analogical mappings, and the problem is when you don't have structural correlates. Can I just add to that one point? The minute you have an interpretation for that image, mm -hmm. an idea about it, you've given a syntactic instruction which absolutely linearizes the mm -hmm. I mean, this is the sort of thing they've shown in Rochester with the eye track and you can right. right and it's like right. And I, I think that is something that plays into this. Is that yes. You can't avoid that bias. Yeah. There definitely has much fear. Yeah. But whatever he, yeah. he intended, the minute you have an interpretation, right. you there, there gets to be that. The other thing is, is that there's also uh, work in, in a related way, but just taking us into even literature and that. Even when you're reading a story, you'll do eye tracking in different kinds. If there's, if there's you know, visual images that will admit that. And so this is, this is just a really ingrained part. So I would actually say for some people listening to music, they might well have eye tracking things that are happening there as well, depending upon their, their listening habits. Richard's getting me the hook. No, I'm going to take the liberty of drawing an analogy between Equinox and the middle of the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> the halfway point of our, uh, of our allotted time here, it's, it's approaching. So I'd like to thank Larry very much. <laughs>